Game on, Infernal Shrines in Division 7. We are back with the Sloth High Lords going up against Most Wanted. So after we had the Nexus Contest coming in, a lot of the Nation Cups games and other stuff, we're now looking again at a Division 7 match. And our first map is Infernal Shrines. That alone makes me happy because Infernal <laughs> Shrines is usually, usually the map where we see a lot of fights. And in Division 7, that means we have normally a lot of fun with it. So, Garrosh being banned out. I kind of have to adjust my brain again from casting the Nexus Contest, where teams are properly drafting and everything, to the Fiesta that could come in Division 7. Could, but doesn't necessarily have to. The Garrosh ban is already pretty much on the standard, but Mayev was one of the heroes that you saw banned out in every single game looking at the Nexus Contest. And that's a hero that oftentimes in uh, Division 7 of Heroes Launch doesn't really get any attention whatsoever. And if you've been living under a rock for the last couple of weeks and months and you don't know what Division 7 is, Division 7 is the lowest league in Heroes Launch, which is an amateur league that exists in Europe and in North America. So if you want to play, definitely check it out. It's heroeslaunch.gg. But Division 7 means that we are seeing bronze to gold players most of the time. So it's a bit of an average that's taken every now and then. There's a little bit of a gold one player that sneaks into one of the teams. But outside of that, it's still very much so towards the bottom. So it's more of a fun thing that we have here. With now Phoenix being banned out and... Sylvanas banned. All right, we're letting Genji through. We are letting that Mayev through too because nobody can play those two anyways. So let's just see what we're going to get instead. Are you rel at the first pick? Already amazed because that's pretty much... It's a little bit meta at least. Priority might not be quite on point, but still, that's a good hero for the off lane. And also for the Shrine Control as it stands. I'm more interested if you're going to see an Asmodan again. <laughs> because Infernal Shrines is the map where in Division 7, Asmodan is pretty, pretty tempting. That's one of the heroes we are saying like, ha <laughs> ha. Get that orb in and do some damage. Gul'dan and Johanna. Wave clear, baby. Gul'dan. Haven't seen a Reign of Destruction yet. Don't really assume we're going to get one of those in this game either, but you never know. But normally, even on that level of play, people know that Reign of Destruction is basically not a real ult. So, uh, there's the Deckard Kane. Diablo has been banned out, but Melganis hasn't. Dreadlord time. Fell Claw action and Night Rush. Let's put the opponent to sleep. This is basically the f this is a, what we call a resident sleeper combo. You have the stay on white and listen potentially from Deckard Kane. And then Melganus too. The only thing that misses here is a double support setup with Anna for the sleeping dart. And you can just can put all of them to sleep the entire time. But we have bands coming in again. And with the bands, of course, a big question, what do you do now if you are the Sloth High Lords? You ban our <laughs> Tracer. Uh, okay. Um, don't really think that what most wanted has synergizes really well with Tracer, but then again, if you have a good Tracer player on the other side, and I have to admit that I don't know if most wanted do, then that could become a bit of a problem. Tracer can be played here, but again, it's not really a hero that you see here too much, but we have definitely seen her in Infernal Shrines on the higher level as well. So it's a little bit of an offlane target that we're seeing on the third band for Most Wanted, taking Thrall out of the equation, allowing Urel to play her thing here. I would have rather expected, if they wanted to ban offlane, to see Dehaka or Blaze being banned out. But Thrall can be pretty nice still with the lockdown. But still not really what I expected. Because right now, I mean, we'll have two picks that come in, but right now I don't see the reason for it. Blaze and Rainer. Guys, okay, this is actually a pretty, pretty decent draft. They go in late on the support, but as long as they don't pick Lucio or Brightwing, well, they're going to be fine here. I'm actually looking at a really solid draft for the time being. What does Most Wanted do? Are we going to see any shenanigans from them? Melganis is already a little bit interesting. Might be the main tag, might be the offlaner, but with Ural there, she's probably going to take the offlane for sure. So we need the damage healer. Skelthas! And Genji! Okay! I've seen crazier drafts in Division 7. This is still pretty much normal, and now don't disappoint me. Don't disappoint me. I know you're tempted. Pick that Lucio. Pick... Uh, no, 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 don't do that. Pick Alexstrasza. Pick Toranda, which we haven't, by the way, seen at all. Pick Malfurion. Pick White Mane. Even Rhaegar. There are options here. There are options. There we go. Stukov. Another good option. Another good option. I like that. I like that. They already 
pretty much all pass the IQ test. No Brightwing, no Lucio. Thumbs up. I approve. All right, Infernal Shrines, game number one. Let's check that out and see what we're going to get from uh, Most Wanted and uh, the Sloth High Lords. Game on, ladies and gentlemen. Game number one uh, here in Division 7 with the Sloth High Lords. On the left side of the map, Bloody on Gul'dan, Scythe on Reyna, Hamas Valas on Stukov, Simolio on Johanna, and Blue on Blaze. And to the right side of the map, Nexus Most Wanted with Strider on Urel, Elena on Deckard Kane, Pangris on Malganus, and Mialan on Genji with the Hunter on Kelthas. No convection! What is this? All of a sudden, all of the Division 7 teams are starting to actually pick sensible talents and play rather well these days. It's a little bit disconcerting. It seems like everybody is watching the other Division 7 games that we are casting and taking notes in the meantime and really picking up on all of the talent choices and the hero picks. Interesting approach here with the Spine Launcher. I mean, not ne uh, we have seen that before. It's not really quite the talent I would go for, but if you are a little bit afraid that you're too far out there, you want to make sure that you are a bit more ranged, then fair enough, you can get that too. Not really faulting anyone on a lower division for a talent like that. It keeps you a bit safer, Stukov in the back. You're never really tempted to go in for one of those hard-hitting auto attacks. So, we'll take it. And we have a rotation going on. Up to the top, it's Blaze against Ural, as expected. So our two solo laners are going to do their thing. And down here, we have a rotation happening between the two teams, where Johanna is trying to get the anchor play continuously. We have quite a bit of slow, by the way, stacked for the ace in the hole as the level one talent. First of all, we're going to see that around Stuko, but also Johanna can provide it. And we have stuns and also the oil spill from Blaze. So the rotation is there. And now one of the things that I kind of feel I have to explain a little bit when it comes to rotations, we don't really get too much chance. When we talk about a four-man rotation, what is the goal of the four-man rotation? The four-man rotation goal when you're playing on Tomb of the Spider Queen or any other map is normally to just go for the wave clear. You're pretty much ignoring your opponent. You're just clearing the wave as quickly as they can and you rotate down, clear the wave and rotate up. If your opponent starts uh, hitting you a little bit, they don't hit the wave. So they have to stay on that lane longer to make sure they don't lose experience. And then they start falling behind. If you're at any point in your rotation between the two lanes, all of a sudden see a hero that you can kill with a quick combo, or where you can put a lot of damage out, you'll still do that. So it's not like you don't want to fight at all. But your goal normally is still just simply make sure that you take the wave down and then rotate and therefore put the macro pressure onto your opponent. That's one of the the big goals that you have with that. So that's something to com be considered here when you're talking about all of this and when you're making your own play. And for example, the Sloth High Lords do exactly that. And uh, this forces, as you can see here, most wanted to stay on the lanes and just react. So they're already in a very reactionary pattern because of the mercenary camps that also got taken now. So that makes their life a little bit harder. And if these guys are a bit faster with the wave clear here, they can push that in. And uh, we're seeing uh, already one hero just sitting behind the gate because they know they can't do anything. That's an easier rotation. You have more map control. Your opponent doesn't have as easy vision around you. So they're starting to dominate the early game a little bit. And you can then in the rotation also try and get kills. But that's normally what we're talking in terms of setup whenever we're talking about like a 1-4 split in a four-man rotation here. Just so that you know a little bit what's going on with that. First Shrine is activating on the map, and we're having actually as talent the Potion of Shielding here taken for Deckard Kane, so trying to get the shields out too. The red team, after all, is able to get this position, but this was taken. So with the Shaman Camp pushing through the top lane, Blaze even staying a bit longer to take mostly this wave out, they might get a lead, most wanted that is, but time is working against them. And here comes the attack. Jet Propulsion, where like, ooh, Scythe is very low, and Genji goes in and wants the kill. He himself takes a lot of damage on the other hand. But this is now where we have, again, the Night Rush coming in. Sleep comes through. They're trying to go for Blaze. But keep in mind that this camp at the top lane is going to start to do very, very solid damage. But thankfully, the tower is actually focusing on the Shaman. That's a bit of a lucky coincidence here for Most Wanted. That works really well for them. Ooh, Living Bomb. Don't worry about that. Be careful. But we have still the lead for the blue team. They're eating a lot of damage here, but they're starting to move in again, especially onto Kalthas, trying to get the backliner here, as Reyna is pushing Malganis out, and the position on the shrine itself has been taken again. Ural jumping in, Malganis low, and Johanna a bit too aggressive for that, spreading the bombs, by the way, between the two in the backline here. 
But this position is really, really solid for Sloth High Lords. They are doing extremely well with the early level 7 now, too, compared to their opponent. Good control over the choke point with a silence and the lurking arm. Iron Skin had to be used. Nice negating most of the damage here. Genji wants the kill. 33 stacks against 14. Simolio is able to walk away. Oh, Genji barely survives this one. But the situation is more than only a little bit dire for Nexus Most Wanted. They're going to lose the first objective nearly for sure. Johanna moves in. Another Iron Skin gets the hit in. And now you want to get the hell out of dodge if you're Most Wanted. You don't want to proc the jump on the Punisher. Vision is there. Already the slow against the Hunter. And the push through the mid lane here, with Johanna actually rotating topside. It's not Blaze that takes the top lane, instead it's Johanna. I'm not 100% certain why exactly that is. Reyna is moving down to the bottom of the map. But here comes again the quick silence, and already the attempt to break at least through the wall while the bot lane gets, be gets pushed in too. Nobody seems to be reacting from the red team, so that is another wave that's going to be lost. They're not rotating down. Nobody makes a rotation down to the bottom, and that now means that the entire wave of experience is lost to them. Good damage also against the fort itself. The wall has been taken apart. And with that experience escorted through by Reyna at the bottom of the map, the result is a level lead for the Sloth High Lords. We're also seeing in terms of talent now, the Will of Tichondria is taken again. So you get even more lifesteal from... Uh, Melganis. I mean, Melganis really wants to attack. That's one of the main things for him, right? He usually stays alive through attacks. He wants to be, really be in the thick of things. Uh, what's bad against him, or well, what's, what's good against him, bad for him, is when you stack stuns on him, or when you just silence him completely, blind him. And that's something that's going to happen quite quickly in those fights through, let's say, for example, Johanna. Same time now, heavy focus into the oil spill, even grill and kill, going a bit more old school these days. Crossfire is oftentimes the talent of choice for most place players on level 7. Not so in this case though, still going for the quest talent here. And starting to fight for the camp again, Genji in the back line, very low and has to be careful, but the camp is stolen and Genji is down, penetrating round from Jim Rayner, delivers the kill and takes him apart here. Top side in the meantime, still pressuring this. It's the first kill of the game, by the way. <laughs> Six and a half minutes in, and it's the first kill of the game. Uh, the Vision 7 teams here are currently doing fairly well. Again, heroic ability is being picked, and immediately Hyperion, they're trying to use that advantage as much as they can. Horrify, barely not hitting the Hunter properly, pushes him to the bottom in that instead of into the team, which of course the initial idea was. And what is this? We see Bunker over Combustion. I'm actually amazed. This is starting to become uh, more and more meta what we're seeing here. Division 7 is famous for their Combustion plays, but no, it is Bunker time. Let's find out if they can use that properly. I think we had in Division 7 actually one Bunker, and it showed why <laughs> a lot of teams here don't play Bunker, <laughs> simply because nobody A used it, and that includes play, so he never really threw it out either. This might be a bit of a different game though. We'll see. Carrion Swarm taken again. Pyroblast for Kel'Thas, who by the way went also into the mana tab as the level 4 talent here. And then straight into the burn flesh on level 7. I mean, there's no 4 taken down yet, but there's still a level lead on the blue team. Sloth High Lords are currently ahead. Well, by a small margin, but I mean, they are ahead. I would like to see a few more combos around the CC from Nexus Most Wanted, maybe trying to engage with Malganus and sleep someone and then a Gravity Lapse follow-up. But so far we haven't really seen that much coordination around that. Now that we have a rogue abilities, we could definitely see a lot of kill combos from exactly this team. Yeah, a little bit late on a lot of those setups though. Here comes, oh, Bless Shield and Horrify. Stacked, but they still get the kill. Could have been executed a little bit cleaner, to be honest with you. Especially after the lurking arm was on the ground. I think there was a good chance for them to use the blessed shield first, just to lock the target down. No matter how they did it, they successfully took down Urel. She never really used her ult, had very little chance to do that, with the silence and the stuns being stacked, and the horrify, of course, on top of it too. But definitely one of those instances where the sloth high lords get a kill at a very good uh, moment in time. Up to the top, both of them. Now with their camps, the two shaman camps against each other, but this should still push a little bit. Turret, on the other hand, is going to help them out here. And as we have the pause, we have the full position on the shrine. So this is really going to be another big, big lead on the stacks for the Sloth High Lords. And if they play their cards right, it could be another Punisher that moves down to the bot lane where there's already no wall. So that means very likely to drop the first fort in the game if they're able to get it. And since Urel is still missing for another two seconds, 
and on top of that has to make her way into the middle that's a very good chance for them to walk away with a pretty significant experience lead so i really think that the red team is going to be forced to take the fight no matter what but they might not have the time because you look at this setup and you have 17 stacks already by the time you arrives here yeah, very likely that punisher is taken but this is now one of the problems for nexus most wanted that we oftentimes see on infernal shrines when you're able to win two punishers in a row and you also take the macro advantage on the map you will start running such a huge lead in experience that with the upcoming objectives, it's very likely for them to always have a lead in talents. And that's what's really terrifying when you're playing on this map in particular, because it can really snowball the game a little bit. Unless the team that is behind finds some isolated kills on the map and is able to work through that. I mean, for now, we didn't really have any massive fights. If you look at the damage output, for example, we're sitting at 15,000 for Gul'dan and Reyna, 15k for Kalthas as well. But most of this damage really came through the two attacks where they ganked up on targets and that one fi shine, uh, shrine fight. Two kills against zero isn't really all that much. Eight and a half minutes in when we're looking at the second objective. But the problem is really that Most Wanted is trying to find a game or a way back into this. And I think the only thing they really can do is try and get kills here. And that's going to be difficult. Pyroblast alone, looking at Kalthas here, is going to be... I mean, I don't really want to say negated, but if you play properly and you watch out for the Pyroblast, a bunker can definitely just completely negate the value that you get out of it if placed at the right moment in time. So this is something that has to concern most wanted a lot. And Sloth High Lords, for them, it's just play it safe, play it as, well, as disciplined as you can, and you're going to be fine here. And I'm honestly still a little bit amazed that we have those two teams in Division 7, because up to this point, at least, yes, there might have been some mistakes, but in general, it's not quite the fiesta that we usually expect from a Division 7 player. I mean, even looking at the talents right now, we have Fight or Flight on the side of Jimmy, we have level 7 talent, Unstable Compound, so pretty much the standard build for him, and that's reflected on most of the heroes. Now, we have adjustments. I talked a bit about the Spine Launcher at the beginning of the game, but even with that being used, and uh, now Stuko playing safer, the sentiment behind it is not like, kill them faster! It's like, let's try and stay safe and not die. And that is usually a core concept that gets lost the deeper you dive down in leagues and division. So it's more of a safety thing than anything else. And when you look over to their opponent, it's pretty much the same thought process reflected here. So even especially like Mana Addict on level 1, not even Convection being picked here. So it's a very safe play that we're having from both teams right now and a really solid position for Sloth High Lords. But we have seen crazy comebacks in Division 7, so as we hopefully have the game continue in a moment, we still have to watch out for that because we have seen a lot of games turn within just a second from a team that was leading significantly and then go into a fight a bit too deep, get completely wiped and then turned around. And we're back to business. All right, as we have the disconnected player rejoining, we have definitely another Punisher. And this is, by the way, an Arcane Punisher. I haven't even mentioned that yet for them. And Urel is already moving straight to the top. Doesn't even bother going into the middle. They already know that's not going to work for them. The camp here is going to be deep push, but they can definitely take one or two waves. If Urel now takes this wave or two, they can put a lot of pressure onto that structure. She doesn't really bother with it, but definitely could at this point. This is one of those moments, if you can take that down, you're going to be in a great spot to put some structural damage in. But she's actually trying to interrupt plays at the bottom of the map. Now the Punisher push is <laughs> escorted by an IP and it's getting already thrown out here. And yeah, that Punisher is already working straight towards that wall. Down goes the forward, I mean that was a given. And they are closing in on level 13 talents as well. But this is the moment when the, the red team, when Nexus most wanted, is starting to fall behind in talents. That 13 is going to be there any second. Big question now is, can you get a kill here? I uh, doubt it a bit. Maybe with a good Horrify they could. That's a Horrify opportunity right there. Horrify already being used. Didn't even hit him, I think. But he's dying anyways. Yeah. Melganes goes down. He's eliminated. And they are now on 13 talents against 12. Still not massively ahead. But if they can get a level 16 around it, that would be great. Ooh, look at that. Harvest life. Okay, there we go. Talking about potential fiestas. There we have it. Harvest life being taken on level 13. So trying to get a little bit more sustain. Maybe draining Genji whenever he makes the move in. But with that being said, we have now still both of them fairly much or so on the same 
talent here. As level 13 is soon going to be ready for most wanted too. But the Sloth Eilots are currently playing this quite nicely. I'm just waiting for the moment when we're seeing Nexus Most Wanted really starting to make a play by himself. Maybe get a kill into that backline. Try and drop that. Okay, now go on to, let's say, Gul'dan and get a kill in. And they're already suffering. On Urel has to use the ult here too. Alright, able to move out. It is a cool combo. Again, if you play Stukov and you're able to really dominate the map and you're the one that initiates the fights, you can always lead with a stun and then go straight into the silence. And you're going to be in absolutely fantastic position. So that's one of the things that we could see out here. Alright, let's go and check that out. Already Strider starting to jump in here again. And yeah, that's the kill against Urel. Bit too aggressive, but Jimmy goes down too. Pyroblast, no bunker being used, and all of a sudden they're on the move. With Blaze at the top, there was no bunker. Keltha survives, by the way. <laughs> that shove actually saved him. Could have theoretically even killed him, but he still had the shield up, uses that immediately, and now we have a one-for-one one trading kill. As problematic is, of course, that Blaze during all of this was up at the top. That's one of the reasons why he couldn't counteract the Pyroblast with his bunker, but he still gets a lot of experience for his team. With level 13 talents, we also have by now the Fission Bomb. So increasing that radius by 20%, that's going to help them in those Shrine battles, for sure. That fort is still in game, but keep in mind that with a fort eliminated at the bottom of the map, not only will there be a catapult every third minion wave for the Sloth High Lords, but at the same time, their passive experience is going to be increased. And now, welcome to the problem that I mentioned before. Shrine gets announced in the middle, and what do we see? Level 16 just ready for the Sloth High Lords. And next is most wanted, a level behind. That's exactly that problem uh, with you losing too much in the early game, that all of a sudden every objective spawns around a talent's disadvantage. And that's a massive issue now. Because not only do we have Runa's Affliction here, we have another fantastic talent for Jimmy with the Paint and Rat. That's going to be great for him. And this is going to become very problematic. Because now you have to ask yourself, do we really want to engage into this? Can we afford to lose another Punisher here? It's going to be a Mortar Punisher here for them now. And we have the attack coming in with, uh, yep, the Night Rush hitting two. Hyperion is there. The damage onto Reyna, but he survives through that. Fight or flight already procced. And Malganis with a Carrion Swarm, a little bit early to be honest, to drop that. It's still one of the tools he can use to also escape here. Blaze with a nice jet propulsion, but Jimmy is low. Not gonna die for. Oh, he actually dies! Jimmy dies with the Pyroblast. I thought he had enough survive through it, but that's not the case. And that might be just what Nexus most wanted needed to win this after all. They're starting to go in, and of course, the Hunter with those living bombs can get massive damage out. Gets a lot. Oh my god, Stukov is gonna fall. They have two kills. They actually make it work. They have the talent disadvantage, but they go in, they get the double kill. Now they have 16 themselves, and they can focus onto the shrine. Top lane is, of course, in a bit of trouble, since there is another Shaman camp pushing through that might drop the fort, but Urel has already acknowledged that and is moving topside. They see that too, and the outside poke is now ready. Johanna goes in pretty deep. They need to be a little bit, do, doing a little bit more work with this. Kelthas needs to use his AoE on the Shrine itself. It's 27 stacks against 17, and guess what? Jimmy is already back to business, and Stukov is going to come into this very soon. They're actually not fighting over it, though. Ooh, I'm not so sure about that choice. The Sloth High Lords rotated to the bot lane to take the camp, but they could have easily started to fight for this one again. But with them now having to move straight there, they might be a little bit too late. If they would have poked from the outside, they might just have gotten enough to fight over this after all. But as it stands, that is a Punisher for Nexus Most Wanted. And that's their chance to come back into this. Urel is moving to the bottom of the map. She has to deal with this. With the catapults and the camp, it's just too much pressure against the keep. It's good that they're paying attention, actually. I really like that. They're not just homing in on that mid lane attack, but instead realize that they have to defend their own keep. And they've taken damage at a lot of fronts already. But they're more or less back to business, at least in experience. Here comes the Hyperion. And the least that they want out of this is, of course, the Ford. Here comes the Carrion Swarm again from Malganis. Good silence. And just focus on... Ooh, the Horrify again not hitting. Pushes the target out and actually saves it. Stay a while and get listen. Sleep, baby. And the Pyroblast. Can they take... Yeah, Stukov. He's gonna fall. 
Stukov gets reacted. and oh my god, the damage from Kelthas, the Punisher with a jump, the triple kill as Johanna and Gul'dan both fall. And now Genji trying to make the play, goes in deep, maybe a little bit too deep, but he doesn't fall, the wall is already open and they're even taking the towers now. Great attack by Most Wanted and the comeback starts. Six kills against four now and the lead in experience. Damn. Yeah, I think there were a lot of moments actually where they might have been able to use that bunker play just to save a few heroes, so that was a bit late. But again, it's one of the things that we already observed in previous games, that bunker is used very hesitantly instead of just thrown out in the middle of the fight to get the damage. And it can even be used on the shrine to just get more control over the minion stacks and run this objective a little bit faster. Just use those flamethrowers to drop the minions, but they have not really done that. And instead, now they're losing another fort. So all of a sudden, Nexus most wonders ahead. Just like that. They got the kill against Reyna early, the kill against Jimmy through the Pyroblast, and now they're looking quite solid here. Catapult's pushing mid lane and top lane. At the bot lane, they need to be a bit more careful. But that was a fantastic start back into the game for them. And that's exactly what we want from Division 7, <laughs> back and forth. And right now, 53,000 damage on Kalthas pretty much tell you the story here. Like, he can definitely write home about that one. Like, Mom, you have no idea, but like, today was a great game. Like, Mom, I was the top damage dealer in my game. Mom! It was awesome. But they haven't won the game yet. <laughs> Kalthas might be able to get a lot of damage in, but they haven't really won the game just yet. It's pretty solid how he gets out in damage numbers, on the other hand. I mean, with him now, with Ignite, He's just spreading bombs all day long, and then the level 13 talent just helps him with the additional range. That's pretty sweet. And they're defending top lane right now. Cams are coming through. And once that the Hunter has 20, he is also going to have that extra distance, and that's going to be great. Oh, bombs everywhere! But Mulganis might fall! Oh, he barely keeps alive, but dies a second before the Carrion Swarm comes back. Quite unfortunate for him, and a great kill, of course for the Sloth High Lords, especially since they took the 4-2. Though all of a sudden they're looking for more kills. But damn, what a battle against Malganis. Like, he was just trying to get those hits. He was like, one more second. And just before he gets the Carrion Swarm back up, he goes down. The next Shrine activated in 20 seconds for both teams to grab those level 20 talents. And that's where we see the rotation towards the bottom mid lane coming from Nexus Most Wanted. Should also be enough time for them to get Malganis back into the picture. But of course, 20 talents are going to be absolutely phenomenal for both of the teams. Uh, outside of that, they're also starting to take down here at the bottom another camp. That should be a pretty easy grab for them. Storm talents are in, and the blue team isn't even in position for the shrine yet. So yes, they will still take a slight lead, but it's going to be a lot smaller than the, what they could have gotten here. And we have another arcane punisher coming in now. Indomitable resolve on Jimmy. Uh, outside of that, the fortified bunker. Gul'dan, by the way, hasn't really completed his level 1 quest yet, so that's a bit of a problem. And here we have now the 20 talents for their opponent, the Living Weapon, with a cooldown reduction on the X-Strike, alone in the dark, first of all, so that's going to be pretty sweet. But when you look at the bottomless flask, that's really where the money is. And they're just letting it go! What are you doing, Red Team? You drunk? Go home! You could have fought over this easily. They had the 20. A little bit surprised, they're just sitting there and taking it. I mean, again, that's a defense that you can pull off, but you go up against an Arcane Punisher. I'm honestly a little bit surprised. That was definitely one that he could fight, for, fight over. Take the position, rotate in, especially with the blue team delaying it quite by a lot. Alright, it's time for uh, the Hunter and the Flame Strikes, trying to get those Ignite Living Bombs through. Here comes the Silence already. Okay, bait over the wall, I like that. And now where are the flame th strikes? Here comes the Hyperion on 20. Another flame strike coming in, but missing at least for now. Not coordinating the choke points as they could. Again, Malganis with a sleep. Urel jumps in through. Oh, the living bomb. The value. Jimmy nearly down, but no Pyroblast yet. No Pyroblast used. No heroic abilities used outside of the Hyperion for the blue team at all. But here we come back in really deep and the horrify against Malganis and he dies again. Baited in a bit too deep. You can't get isolated that heavily if you know that your opponent still has the horrify up. That's a great spread though. 
heading the bombs in, but the keep is already down. They're not going to lose the core on the other hand, but still, that was a lot of work done here by the blue team again, getting the objective, then taking down the keep, and in the process also eliminating... They try to core? Wait, what? In the process also eliminating Meganis. This is a little bit optimistic what they're trying to do here right now. Uh, Urel? All right, there's the old. Urel gets the old, and now it's flame strike time. I'm not sure what the blue team is doing. There's no way they can uh, they can core. No way whatsoever. Bunker is there. Stukov did not go into it, and all of a sudden they're losing Stukov. They're losing Kultan, and guess what? Yep, they're gonna lose a lot more now. They're gonna lose Blaze at least. <laughs> Look at who's still in the bunker, by the way. Johanna was hiding. She's like, if they don't see me, they can't kill me. All right, gets a little bit more damage in, but yeah, I'm actually surprised that they didn't kill Blaze too, but they still get the two kills here. So, blue team with a bit of a questionable choice, because not only did they not kill the core, they also took a lot of damage at their own keep here. If you're in a five versus four, and the only hero that is dead on the other side is the tank, you should think twice about trying to go for core. Especially if you don't have a talent advantage, and they didn't have that. So this game isn't over. Not by a long shot. Not by a long shot. Let's take a look at those damage numbers. Look at Kalthas, 95,000, and uh oh, baby, five versus three. You know how those usually go. Yeah, they don't go well for the team that has only three on the map. Not only is the camp stolen, Blaze is taking out two, and what's worse, it's a staggered death. Just as Stukov and Gul'dan are about to come back, Blaze goes down, and this is a free keep. Can just poke away. Nothing to stop you. This is a great opportunity right now for the Nexus Most Wanted to take this one. Should think twice about trying to core though. Just a tip. It's just a tip. But they can push the top lane or they can take all the camps on the map right now. And it seems that the latter is what they're going to focus on. Take the mercenary camps, create more pressure on the lanes and then go into the next objective with your opponent having to invest time to de-push the lanes or simply accepting that they're going to take damage on their structures. So we are starting to look extremely solid here. 54 stacks, by the way, on the level 1 right now. So the mana pool of Kel'thas is pretty solid at this point. Not going to be problem for him and that shield of course is gonna hurt now too well not hurt but it's definitely gonna keep him alive to all of this now Pelganis has to be a bit careful like he got baited a few times by the blue team and every single time that horrify hits him towards the end and he just goes down but now this position is actually very very powerful first of all camp at the bot lane already the rotation coming in from the sloth highlights to deal with that a little bit careful here though a little bit slow we have another taken at the top can also push that wave out very, very easily. Drop the catapult here to make this even m stronger for them. At the end of the day, it's more so about relieving the pressure since their own keep is, of course, down. So that's already what the camp is going to do. And take the lead here. And we're talking 23-minute Punisher. The blue team has to face the music now. You can't just lollygag around down there at the bottom. You have to make a play. Ten stacks are there already. They go through the middle. All right, don't go out too far right now. Just take the advantage. Already the bottomless flasks are set up, and that's great. Five-man sleep. Oh, the flame strike, baby. Ah, doing solid work here, but you don't have to fight it too hard. Just go back, let them make the play. Where's the carry and swarm? No, the horrify combo is there again. Melgan is dying over and over again, and that's the problem. Great stay and wire, listen. Fantastic, but they're trying to sneak the Punisher right now. And I'm not sure if they can. They're going to try to from the outside. Kel'thas goes in again, but the jet propulsion follow-up against Genji. Not protected, by the way. He goes down, and Alena is very likely going to fall too. Well, maybe not, if they can zone it out a little bit more. Run, they got Kane, run. Run, run, run. Don't try to help out too much here. Uh, there's another big hit, and that's actually doing a bit of work, but they're down to heroes now. Down to heroes, top being attacked, double catapult. Um, someone will have to deal with that. But it looks like they're going to be able to get it. Kel'thas sneaks in and he's, he's the only boy who can make it happen. It's a man on a mission right now. There's nobody in here. He just face checks it. He just doesn't give a shit. And he gets a few more stacks out of this. But I doubt that he's going to get enough to win this. Or will he? Ooh, you run! Oh, another big flame strike. And here comes the ult, but not the kill. Scythe is alive. Alive and still kicking, but they're fighting over the objective. They're still fighting here. Kalfas is low. He needs to get away from this one. The silence comes through. More damage. The living bombs are spreading through the ignite. And Mulganis is back to business. And Drena goes down. They actually make it work. They go in against all odds and are able to get the kills here. Another push against Simoleo. 
He's about to fall too. Yet another living bomb that at least gonna proc his ult, and it indeed does. The ult is proc, the Punisher is taken. They go for Stukov, and oh my god, he's gonna die, isn't he? Stukov is about to go down. He might not be the only one. Bloody is back with Gul'dan, but Stukov is eliminated. That bunker didn't do anything, and now they're isolated too. Once they're out of the bunker, they're gonna get absolutely destroyed. No chance for Johannes to survive. The 20 is already on cooldown for two minutes. Unless they let her escape, there's no way Johanna makes it. Genji goes in. What? 20 is still there? Okay, apparently it was the shield earlier. I could have sworn that it wasn't the iron skin, but the unstoppable, but I was wrong. So, Blaze is dead, and Johanna still being challenged by Genji. Johanna, by the way, is completely trapped here. Has to go back with a Hearthstone even, but the core is already under attack. And what looked like an easy game! For the Sloth High Lords, all of a sudden turns around against them. Nexus Most Wanted is going to take game number one here. Eight kills against 12, and what a first map in the best of three here series here in Division 7. GG, well played. Game number two. Dragonshire, Division 7, the Sloth High Lords against Nexus Most Wanted. And to be honest, at the beginning of the game, the High Lords definitely put in a lot of effort. They looked strong, they looked good, they were ahead, and then they went full Sloth mode. They got a little bit lazy, they couldn't really be bothered anymore, and all of a sudden they allow my Nexus Most Wanted to come back into this, and now we have a lead for the Red Team, which I actually didn't expect, um, given how the early game started. And look at that first ban, Respect ban coming through right away. Kalthas, he kinda wrecked us, let's make sure that we're not gonna have to deal with that again. Garrosh, on the other hand, is still so much of a priority that they banned that out, and even Melganis is getting banned. I actually think that Melganis got baited quite a bit and uh, a hero with a better escape tool might be better for uh, Nexus Most Wanted. So if you ask me, I think the Sloth High Lords just did them a favor by banning him out. That being said, first picks. And again, we're, we're talking a lot about the differences, right, between like the top tier teams and between the lower divisions. And in the last game, I tried to talk about a few of these things. And one of the heroes that oftentimes comes to mind is Mayev. But there's another one that we haven't even seen picked or banned in the last game and that oftentimes is ignored, and that's Toranda. And that is always a surprise, because Turan is amazing with her level 7 ability, with the trait, and those stuns as a follow-up. But you need more coordination with her, so that's one of these things where it becomes a little bit tricky for lower league teams to really execute that properly. And well, let's have a quick look at how this is going to go. Johanna, first of all, gets picked right away. And uh, for Dragonshire, that allows you again to have a lot of the wave clear. That means Diablo is on the other hand still open. You could go into a new world build, but there's Diablo. And they got Kane. I wonder if they pick Urel again. Keep in mind, back in the days, we had actually... I think it was like two months nearly? Like one or two, no, make it one month. One month where Diablo, Deckard, Kane, and Urel was absolutely unbeatable because in team fights you would stack armor, you would have high hit point pools, you would have good survivability through, through Deckard, Kane. It was nearly unbeatable as a combo. Very scary. But now the double pick for the High Lords, Lily Asmodan. <laughs> there we go. Johanna Asmodan, and again we have to look towards the stacking. How do you stack with Asmodan? You try to damage the minions first, just a little bit. Asmodan comes in, hits the globe, and another hero, in this case very likely going to be Johanna, moves in, uses their ability, and takes down the waves that Asmodan gets all the stacks. Early game stacking is key with Asmodan. Can't repeat that often enough. If you back home watch this and you are on a lower level and you want to play Asmodan, play Asmodan, but for the love of God, learn how to properly stack and ask one of your teammates to help you in the early game to accomplish that so that you have more momentum going into the mid and late game. Dragonshire as the map for Asmodan. Okay, and Lili. <laughs> the one thing about Lili is just like the insta pick here, right? That's the interesting one. And with that, Jimmy and Sylvanas band out. Okay. So the double pick, how do you react to this? First of all, again, the top lane is going to be interesting. Is it going to be Urel, yes or no? Urel is great on Dragonshire, and yep, there we have it. And Orphea with it as well. Great draft from Nexus No Most Wanted. I kind of like it. Again, couple of things, but still. 
in general, it's a very, very solid draft, whereas the blue team now has to figure out, okay, first of all, what do we do, we do, on, well, uh, what do, we do on off lane? Do we put Asmodan there? Is he going to be part of the rotation, or what's the idea? And then on top of that, of course, what's their damage dealer outside of Asmodan? You want to have a little bit more sustained damage, and Jimmy is banned out. There are other options, but what are they going to opt for? Cassia and Dehaka. So Asmodan going to be part of the rotation. It's a horrible Dehaka skin, by the way, at least on that screen. In game, it looks a little bit better, but still. Um, and let's see, last pick, bit more damage would be nice. I mean, Genji is still around, but you want to have something with a bit more of a punch here. Okay, they still go for it. I mean, they got wave clear, right? So I was worried a little bit about that, but okay, they play Genji heavily ha focused on Ophia, regardless. But yeah, guys, we're ready. Let's go into the game and see if Asmodan works out together with Lili being played here in game number two on Dragon Child. Game number two, Nexus most wanted in the lead and to the left, Bloody on Asmodan, Scythe on Cassia, Dehaka played by Blue, Simolio on Johanna and Hamas Valas on Lili. A lot of blinds stacked on the side of the Blue team. Like might be able to help them out in those team fights. There's still a couple of heroes that pack a punch, even though there is no super strong order attacker, but order attack still uh, uh, they actually account for quite a bit of the damage outside of that. Towards the right side of the damage, Strider on Urel for most wanted. We have Alena on Deckard Kane, Pengris on uh, Diablo, Mialen on Genji, and the Hunter on Orphea. And also immediately here this Thunderstroke build. Alright. I'm really hyped for this one. I want to see how well the stacking process works for the Sloth High Lords, if they know how to properly pull that off or not. And also I'm pretty happy that we're seeing that poke build on uh, Scythe himself with that setup. Uh, there's already the first one. Get some damage in and defend damage right after. So 10 stacks acquired for Asmodan, that's exactly how you want to play it. Get those early rotations in, make the plays to help Asmodan out, and then he's going to become that menace towards the late game. And he can't only be great in teamfights, there's another added advantage that if you have the Tide of Sin on level 10, you can also take down minion waves very easily from the bot lane, you just throw a globe top. And there you have it, four-man rotation, very strong in the early game, very well stacked by them now too, and immediately the damage output. This one a little bit less successful, only got one single minion out of the entire wave, but the thought is there, and they're doing their best to get that together, and having early on already 20 of those stacks is pretty nice for them. And they continue the same pattern down at the bottom of the map right now, and they get a bit more out of this one. So this is exactly what you have to do. You try to stack it early, and that will then, around level 10, help Asmodan to get all of this quite easily on his own when he can use Tide of Sin for the damage increase. And uh, once again, that should be a fiver, and pretty much already getting 10 additional stacks there. And also an additional stacks on, uh, st stack on the level 1. Thunderstroke. Fantastic talent. It's a very fun build to play. If you have never played Cassia with that particular build, I can highly recommend it. Thunderstrokes on level 1, then on level 13 and 16, you want to make sure that you get cooldown reduction at Pierce. And it is definitely a build that can do a lot of work. You can stay a bit safe at a distance. You don't have to commit heavily to what's fend and expose yourself to your opponent. There's cool plays around there. Yeah, already the attack up to the top. Doesn't really get any stacks, but helps out with the wave clear, and Genji is going to have some trouble with this. The shrine's up on the map right now, though, and that means that we have level 4 abilities, of course, too. And that's even more damage when everybody stacks on the temple it as well. Then Asmodan can simply go and start attacking the heroes instead. By the way, we have a bit of an alternative build for Ophia here with the on point on level 1, so it increases the Shadow Wall's damage, but you can't really... I mean, they have some slows, so I could have definitely seen them go for the standard here, trying to get that extra damage there too. They decided otherwise, and are now hitting straight into Chomp instead. So not the standard build that we've seen, for example, played at the Nexus contest continuously. But even more stacks coming in now for Asmodan. He's sitting at 74 already, so doing quite a bit of work with this. The rotations are still strong from the red team as they're moving in again, trying to jump away here. Asmodan with a hit and connects with even more heroes. Great for him. Cassia holding the fort or the dragon statue in the mid lane, making sure that with the control of those two shrines, there's no chance for the opponent to get it. And by the way, talking about that, let's look at the top lane quickly because... She seems to be misplaying that quite a bit. If you have a... 
Oh no, sorry, my bad. I, I mixed up the teams for a second. I was just like, how on earth is the Haka holding the top shrine against Urel? That should never have happened. But yeah, obviously Urel part of the red team, so that makes a lot of sense that she's able to hold that shrine for most of the time. So the Haka for now grabs it back, but he's eventually going to lose out on it again. But just look at Asmodan. That's what stacking looks like. Bam, and nearly a hundred stacks acquired already. And this Asmodan is going to have a lot of fun in the late game if we continue that. Ah, Johanna here. Johanna could have gone for the Arblo. He could have just gotten the stacks right there. But either way, they still are able to nearly get the 100. So that's already great for them. That being said, though, I mean, the red team still has a really strong combo. And they are using it against Asmodan. Nice move by the Arblo. Not quite able to make the play here, but still. Definitely pressuring the heroes whenever they can. Level 7 talent now for both teams. And with that, we get the cleanse on the side of Lili, going straight into the let's go. Also, outside of that, we're having a level 7 talent with the impale right now. Uh, going straight for the extra damage. I mean, as a finisher, it's fantastic. You poke at the start, and then you're trying to finish off with, uh, with a Fent. It's actually pretty well done. And more stacks, 125. We're getting there. Getting there and getting the burn in as well with the Master of Destruction. Gets those stacks through it too. Johanna in trouble. Another good Orb of Annihilation coming through. Another big hit here. And we're looking at 137 already. Asmodan is getting the work done. Still in the middle. Cassia, the defend. But you can already see on the damage itself that Asmodan with 11,000 damage is looking pretty strong here. And I mean, keep in mind, <laughs> I mean, we're talking about this a lot. Normally the hero damage shouldn't really be too high for Asmodan at the beginning of the game. The reason quite simple. You want to hit the minion waves. That's where you get most of your stacks. Obviously, if your opponent is dumb enough to clump up on one point with five heroes, then hell yeah, take that chance and get those stacks. But if that's not the case, you want to hit minion waves instead, and then in the later stages of the game, that's normally when you're going to get a lot of your damage out of uh, just simply hitting heroes, depending on how you play the game there. But more stacks are coming in. And as long as the game doesn't really shift into the direction of most wanted, they should be really worried about the late game. Because a big and fat Asmodan is actually insanely scary to go up against. The chomp build continues for a fear with Insatiable as level 7. The cooler reduction whenever you hit here. And Afia is trying to make exactly that work. More Asmodan stacks are coming in. Diablo on the other hand is stacking his own quest and has now the full stacks on his souls. So we're going to see him not only very hit point heavy but also returning if they are able to take him down at any point. Asmodan still trying to acquire a few extra stacks by simply hitting heroes now. And up to the top, the Haka with a solo kill. Ooh, that shouldn't happen. Blue is able to get the kill here. Look at that. That's a scary dinosaur. Uh, he even gets some help through Asmodan, who specs his trade up to the top. But this is now taking a lot of experience away from uh, the red team. That's a problem. A massive one at that. And now losing another hero as Ophia falls is another big issue. Level 10 abilities in the hands of the Sloth High Lords allow them to get another easy kill at the bot lane. And that's currently a disaster. That game is shifting quickly. I mean, just look at this wall here. Nearly destroying the second turret as well. Just as Strider comes back, doesn't have the level 10 yet. Another fight down here. Diablo is very much alone. He needs to be very careful with this. But able to survive, has the hit point pool to sustain himself through that. Finally, level 10 abilities on the other side. And Asmodan is nearly at the point where he can solo take these waves out. And that's insanely important because then, first of all, his own stacking is quite easily done. And on top of that, the damage output comes through too. I mean, the quest talent is nearly completed. And the cooldown reduction is going to be great for him. Yep, there we have that. 200 stacks for him. So Gluttony has already been completed. Now we're working on the base quest with the Annihilation. And that's exactly what they're going to do here at the bot lane right now. Especially, of course, with the Tides of Thin. Another big hit. Nearly taking down the entire wave. But they still need some extra work here. That's really where the Shield Clear, for example, could just get those minions down. But he gets the hits in. Easy peasy. And the cooldown reduction through it too. The top lane battle, on the other hand, that continues. And Strider is going to try and take the control. We haven't still seen a single Dragonite in this game. But it's mostly about bot lane damage. And talking about damage, Ophia goes down again. The X strike comes in. But Lili with the old. Healing everyone. Easy peasy. Another great hit from Asmodan as he connects with two. In comes the Fen. Cassia is currently sitting at 20 stacks on her level 1 talent. So she's now already getting the first quest reward. 
But with a level 13 talents, she's going to try and look for the max damage output through poke. For the most of the game, she's actually been sitting in the mid lane. It's one of the reasons why it was difficult for Scythe to get that done. But it's slowly starting to shift here. The damage output for Asmodan is pretty powerful too. Big fight here at the top. Asmodan, where's that globe coming? Should come in any second. And yep, there it is. Doesn't hit anything except for the minion though. But Genji is already incredibly low. In comes the Fen. But nice move on the side of Deckard Kane, Putting them to sleep here. Making sure that Genji is able to survive. Diablo on the other hand. He's not making it. He's down. And even now the ult on uh, off here comes in. Doesn't do too much though, and it is a Dragon Knight time. Scythe is getting it, the team is still pushing in, <laughs> and Most Wanted is again behind. Now we've seen the same picture in the first game, but it feels a bit like this is going to be different. Asmodan is sitting at 240 stacks, they are a level ahead, one and a half, even five kills against zero. And the Sloth High Lords, they are playing around the blinds here, they're playing around Asmodan. They have now the control over the map through the global with the Haka, which is of course an added benefit of running the Haka in this game. And it's tough for most wanted to get back into this, what they need are kills. And it's difficult for them to get them, but maybe now? Ah, Lily with her feet is just rushing away here. Easily able to get out of this one. Diablo got punted away. Can they actually get him? They have only a couple of seconds until the Blessed Shield is back ready and that might just be enough. He's trying to escape and with that little move he probably will. Another big hit from Asmodan but it's just not enough to drop Diablo. So job well done by them. Uh, we're chasing a little bit hard if you ask me because the Dragonite in the meantime couldn't really do a whole lot in the bot lane. <laughs> just sitting there like, nah, kind of didn't work out so hmm. So, yeah, 25 stacks by now for Cassia. Now again, one of the disadvantages of having Cassia playing solo in the mid lane was that she never really got a chance to properly stack her level 1, so she's pretty late on that. Still with the Thunder God's Vigor on uh, level 13, so that's now the cooldown reduction, just before you're going to be able to hit the Pierce as well. So that kind of works out for her, but she still needs 15 stacks. And I mean, it is reflected in the damage output against heroes. It's not bad, she's at 28, so she could poke a bit, especially with the Fend damage earlier but you want to have that completed as quickly as you can. Uh, no vision on the map. <laughs> nice, I like that. That was actually really cool. They go for the camp, they realize they don't see anyone anywhere on the map, so instead of going for the camp, they attack the bush, assuming someone's there. And now they are re-engaging with a four versus three, and that is doing work. And oh my god, Deckard Kane got wrecked. The Apocalypse with solid value, but there's not enough damage here. And Tehaka moved in too. Urel is missing. That's another kill against Diablo. And they might even be able to get off here again. They're trying to, and they're so close. And the drag connects, and that's an easy triple kill. Easy peasy. Urel already on the move back up towards the top because she realizes, well, that's jack shit I can do down there. They already took that fight way too early. And that was a very optimistic approach by Most Wanted here, especially after they've seen their opponent originally. So now with level 16 talents, we have the Tunneling Claws for the Haka. We are seeing Pierce coming through from Cassia, who's sitting at 28 stacks. And Asmodan himself by now with nearly 300 stacks on his uh, base quest. And that of course is reflected not only in damage output, I mean just look at this. Easily able to take the down. No problem whatsoever. So he can just really one-shot those uh, waves at this point. And that's all that he has to do to uh, gain map control for his team. By now you also have the additional damage against heroes, which is crazy good whenever they are fighting in a choke point and he's able to hit multiple ones with it. So the situation becomes quite horrible. 8-0 kills. And this is not this is a bit of an issue with uh, two damage dealers. Again, the setup with Diablo, Urel and Deckard Kane is incredibly powerful and had a huge win rate in HGC in 2018. But they're just lacking some of that damage that they need. Ophia is not able to get the numbers through because she's always targeted and uh, easily falls. And Genji, therefore, can't capitalize on anything either. It's very tricky for them to kill anybody here. Especially since there's a ton of blinds. So yes, obviously there's no super heavy auto attack uh, damage dealer on the most wanted side. But those auto attacks still matter. And if you're blind the entire time, if you're Genji and you're trying to go in for the final blow to then get a quick reset on your Swift Strike, then, yeah, well, that's just not happening. Asmodan with even more damage. 320 stacks for him. But Cassia might be in trouble at the bottom of the map. Uh, zoned out, locked down. <laughs> and they still can't kill her. You are shitting me. 
Think about how, how bad they must feel right now. They get the gank against the hero and then they don't play it properly. They think they have it. They don't even use Apocalypse combo or the stay in while in this. And then Cassia simply walks out of it. It's like, nah, you know what? I don't really care. Cassia walks away and they're not getting anything. This is just insane. Uh, also top lane, Strider. Uh, struggling against blue. The Haka is finding the value. Diablo comes in, is trying to sneak uh, sneak this one for now. But they are rotating again, and they're rotating into the middle now. Yep, trying to get another Dragonite. Doesn't quite work out, but still, it's 18 versus 16. I mean, this is the time to fight back, right? Nexus Most Wanted has now a chance to fight back on even talents. But we're having Asmodan moving in, getting the Demon Warriors into play to soak the shots together with the minion wave that's there. And that's an easy second, third fort, actually, that got eliminated here. That last globe hit, maybe not the best one in the game, but still. They're looking good. And they're just taking camps. In the meantime, we have nearly a completed level 1 quest for Cassia. Again, it's late, but once she completes that, her damage output is going to be even bigger. And she's already sitting at 41,000. Sitting way above of Asmodan, who's so far mostly focusing on the lanes still. That might be a good hit, though. Yep, get some additional damage in. Ball of Lightning is there, too. And it just keeps going. Keeps going, but they try to get the counter kill against Cassia. Lili, on the other hand, keeping everyone alive, and this entire fight just threw a wedge between the red team, between the heroes of the red team. They couldn't really get out of it. Apocalypse value. They interrupt also against the channel on the Haka, but the fight is still ongoing, and this is one that they can't lose. Alena is already a little bit low, as we're seeing the massive hit coming for Orb of Annihilation from Asmodan. They're going in. There's a quest complete. Defend against three. Oh my god, what a fight! Diablo nearly dying, but still surviving for a bit more. Everybody is so low, and Genji tries to get the Swift Strike kills and resets, but he just can't get them. They walk away with no one dying in this entire battle, which is insane on the face of it. The interrupt is there again. Diablo moves to the top. He tries to grab the shrine. They need another interrupt. They need another interrupt, and they don't get it. Diablo is too late. And that's another Dragonite for them. Absolute crazy last battle here. No one dying with everything being thrown into the ring. And now another Dragonite at the bot lane. And big damage coming through from Cassia, from Asmodan. It's continuous poke with an Orb of Annihilation and also, of course, the Lightning Fury. And both of them just really add up here. It's brutal. It's absolutely brutal now for Most Wanted. And here comes another approach against <laughs> Diablo getting punted to the side a bit. But yeah, this is just terrifying. Simolio is a bit low, but Lily is already present. No interrupt against her ult is being used here. Ah, there's the stay in while and listen, that shuts that down, but the keep is already down, and they can go for more. Off here, again, suffering from the low hit point pool. If he gets the punt in, she's dead. Punt misses or doesn't get uh, connected, and uh, well, we have the orb also not getting triggered here. Level 20 talents are nearly there, but this is just the Sloth High Lord show. They went Sloth mode in the second part of game number one, but apparently someone has woken them from their slumber, because right now they are bringing the pain, they're bringing the numbers, they're trying to fully stack Asmodan, and guess what, he has his 22. In comes the kill against Urel, counter kill potentially against Johanna, but yeah, I'm just kidding, Iron Skin was ready and she is indestructible as well. They're trying to go even for more here, but things are grim. Asmodan, by now, will get even more damage output. He's six stacks away from making that a reality. And once he has that, his numbers are going to explode even more. And guess what? Here we go. Bam. Base quest completed. Level 20 is now going to get value. That's going to be rough. Infinite Ball of Lightning, by the way, for Cassia, in case that you haven't caught up on that either. So, yeah, there are three levels ahead. Well, maybe two and a half, but still, this is going to be tough. 57,000 damage, 63,000 damage, not a single death. Not a single death on the side of the blue team. Red team just doesn't have the damage output. Look at Genji, 26,000. He just can't secure a kill. That's a big problem for them too. And again, we're seeing just the poke coming in. Big team push also at the top lane from the Bruiser camp and the catapult in the back that has to be dealt with. Uh, Ural can't be too aggressive there. Okay, pushes that back, but the hits keep coming. 
And Asmodan is getting the damage through. And just look at the numbers. All of a sudden, with his level 20 talent and the base quest completed, he's bringing the pain. He's bringing the pain. Oh my god. Like, unbelievable damage here from him now. Deckard Kane is down. Urel is dead. Here comes the Lili old Laser to the ground. Diablo dying. And it's just an absolute bloodbath. As the Sloth Highlights turn Dragonshire into a graveyard, taking Most Wanted down with a perfect game probably here if they continue without losing a hero. And it's just crazy. I mean, they have two keeps already obliterated. Easy peasy, just like that. Two heroes down, can go into the middle and at least drop the keep if they don't want to go for the core, but both of it is possible right now. I mean, if they don't want to go for a core, at least move down and hort and take that keep. I mean, it's so low already, but there, they make the decision, they go for the core, and they're trying to drop that here. Three heroes for the defense, that shouldn't be enough. Again, the laser show, here's the apocalypse, hitting two, tunneling claws, preventing it on the Harker, but the core shield has already fallen. Diablo goes in again for a last desperate attempt to save this. The core is down to 60, it's down to 50. Urel and Deckard Kane are both back. Maybe the defense, can they make it work? Ults are there, but not the important ones. One goes down. Down. Cassia is dead. They go for the kill against Asmodan, but it comes too late. Doesn't come at all. This is the game, and we have game number three coming up. Game number three on Battlefield of Eternity. Also, I was just now told that we had the entire time the uh, Nexus Contest logo in the bottom corner. Obviously, that was not part of the Nations Cup. That is going to continue in a few days again. Uh, but yeah, for now, we're having just Division 7 of Heroes launch. So, uh, absolutely my bad. Remove that for now. But we're going to have to pay attention to that a little bit more in the future. We had a bit of a back and forth, to be honest. I mean, so far, if I would say which team looks... More Sol, I would say Sloth High Lords, but then again, they fell a bit apart in that Infernal Shrine games earlier. But the performance on Battlefield of Eternity was just, uh, sorry, on uh, Dragonshire was fantastic, and on Battlefield of Eternity, the question has now to be answered, where is this damage going to come from, from Nexus Most Wanted? Are they just going to shrug off the last game and say like, nah, whatever, it's going to be fine? Or are we going to see uh, Nexus Most, uh, sorry, the Sloth High Lords just going to completely walk over them again? Kalthas is being banned once more. Apparently, after game number one, they just don't want to deal with that again. And we even have a ban against Asmodan. Now, I don't really think that you have to be afraid of Asmodan necessarily on Battlefield of Eternity. It's a lot more difficult to stack him properly on this map. So, kind of feel this is a bit of a wasted ban, if I'm honest. I mean, it's a two-lane map, and you can't throw the globe from the bot lane to the top lane uh, so you can only reach one lane and that makes it very difficult to properly stack him outside of hero hits but still you shouldn't be able to get too many of those either even if a standoff situation that being said Hanzo as the first pick so obviously on Battlefield of Eternity a few uh, different rules apply Johanna again and Gul'dan Gul'dan very very early there's not really a lot of pressure onto the objective just yet and uh, that's one thing that I would be worried about that's oftentimes we're still on the lower leagues. You will see heroes like Turanda then make their way in. Atanis as well, and I'm still very skeptical on the Atanis pick. I get the idea behind it, but I feel people put a little bit too much value into that amateur opponent on level 1, at least when your Atanis player doesn't land his swaps consistently throughout the game. He usually doesn't give you that much uh, money, uh, that much money for your, for your efforts. So the... Uh, there's just no real payoff, I feel. He can race down the Immortal, on the other hand. So, yeah. The bang for the buck that you get there is a little bit off. Diablo banned out. We have Thrall taken and Deckard Kane. Now, we still have a couple of heroes that are really strong against the Immortal. Also, Li Ming, don't forget about that, is still very, very powerful when we're talking about this particular map. Just having the poke available the entire time from a distance against the Immortal is great. So, we could see that still taken from Most Wanted here. Uh, and let's see. <laughs> Lili banned out, making sure that they don't have access. I mean, again, if you go for Lili in the heal with the ult, if you're playing with Thrall and Deckard Kane, you already have two interrupts against her heroic ability. So if you just hold one of the two back and wait, then you can cancel that out. So that's one of the reasons why you might not have needed to ban her here, unless you, of course, plan of going into Earthquake anyways. There's Blaze and Phoenix. Okay, so only leaving 
their support open. And Phoenix for the first time in the game because he was banned out quite reliably. I want to have a Li Ming right now. Li Ming on their side and what are we going to see as the tank, Diablo band, Garrosh band. Huh, actually it makes things a little bit more tricky. You could go into a mirror then here. Tracer. Okay, we are going to look at kills more so than at an immortal race. Hanzo can of course deliver, but still. Okay, Muradin can stack the storm bolts. Tracer, let's. Tracer was banned out in one of the games. She was banned out in Infernal Shrine, so it seems like there is some Tracer player on the side of Nexus Most Wanted. It's a little bit known to the Sloth High Lords. And call me intrigued. Are we going to see that being a successful strategy for them, or are the Sloth High Lords going to win this? It's going to be the big one. Last pick has to be a support. Stukov maybe again. Could be the choice here. Malfurion. All right, Malfurion, Blaze, Phoenix, Johanna, and Gul'dan. Not a bad setup for them at all. Game three. Who's going to take the series? Division seven. Nexus most wanted. Going up against the Sloth High Lords. The final se game. The final map. Battlefield of Eternity. The Sloth High Lords on the left side with Gul'dan played by Bloody. Scythe on Phoenix, Blue on Blaze, and Hamas Valas on Malfurion with Simolio on Johanna. We've seen a lot of Johanna play by this bad boy. Maybe he's one tricking a little bit too hard here, but so far it has worked out for them. So uh, they're going to try it again. Bloody for those Horrifies. Once more on Gul'dan. Keep in mind, game one. He actually had a huge impact on the result. And to the right side of the map, Nexus Most Wanted with Strider on Thrall, Alena on Deckard Kane. Third time's the charm. Mialen on Tracer. Banned out in game one. Going actually into the Tracer rounds here for the extra vision. And we have Pangurus on Muradin with a level one third win. So not even stacking here. Full trying to go for survivability as Hanzo goes straight into uh, the immortal rush build. Scatter Arrows is going to be the name of the game for him. Top lane as expected, a Thrall going up against Blaze, and Thrall with the Echo of Elements is going to try and stack that as quickly as he can to have it ready for the first Immortal phase. It's going to be the big one for him. Call stacking, obviously. Then we have the Echo Corruption for Gul'dan, who has already three here. But yeah, I'm definitely interested to see how this is going to go, especially from the perspective of Tracer. After Tracer was banned out in game number one, I'm expecting big things from Mialen here. Then again, if you think about it, Phoenix was banned out several times against the Sloth High Lord, so apparently they're a little bit known in Division 7 for their Phoenix play, and Scythe has now to make sure that that reputation is well earned. So we're going to keep our eyes on the two auto attackers, one on each side, to see how that's going to work out for them. Top side, Thrall still pushing this out, four stacks for him so far. Again, it's all about trying to get the stacking process going. Oftentimes you don't really want to deal with your opponent's uh, hero and just simply go for the stacks here. What Blue is trying to do, by the way, is he tries to walk onto the minion that is very low in HP, so to make it more difficult for Strider to get those stacks. That's actually a play that's quite easily done uh, because you can't all of a sudden target your the minion with the Q anymore, instead you're hitting the hero. So that's oftentimes a strategy that's being used to slow down the progress for Thrall's level 1 quest. And if you can just delay him long enough so that during the first objective he doesn't have the second chain lightning, that's already a bit of a win. So uh, he's going to try and do that even more. Mialen here, by the way, has to be a little bit careful. He already ate a lot of damage in this. But he's of course now trying to uh, make sure that he has bomb ready and get the damage through down here. Five stacks for Muradin. Also not really too shabby. Now keep in mind this level one third wind is going to take the pressure away from Deckard Kane a bit too. So he's just going to be able to move away, heal himself up quite nicely. And when you're going up against the Phoenix, but more so a Gul'dan, that is really solid as well. Not the hero that has the wave clear to go for the camp on the other hand. Okay, so they go for four men here. They realize that two heroes are missing. They're saying like, guys, let's take a camp. And that's a very, very early shaman camp that's taken here. Works out, they st should still delay it. Should still delay it a little bit after taking it here. And we'll see if they do that. Or if they grab it right away. Yeah, okay, it's delayed a little bit. I like that a lot. Just make sure that nobody moves in. We had actually a couple of ridiculous games where they took the camp, moved away to heal, and in the meantime, someone just walked over, took the camp, and moved away again. <laughs> that happened several times now. And every single time, it's just absolutely ridicu uh, ridiculous. So yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, with that being said, we have now both uh, both teams with a Shaman camp taken. And of course, the race is pretty much on bot lane. 
is getting pushed out here. Tracer even. Look at that. Damage on four. Untouchable. Okay, baby. You gotta show me something now. Going for the untouchable here. That shows confidence. And I'm not quite sure if I share that necessarily. Muradin is very happy that he took the third win on level one because he just got bodied in that fight. <laughs> In terms of stacks, Echo of Elements is also quite a bit away from getting completed here. Only 12 stacks for him now. No chance of getting the second charge during the Immortal Pressure. Talking Immortal Pressure, Hanzo is doing Hanzo things right now. Trying to race that down. Both of them just focusing on the attack for the time being. Just a bit of an attempt to push out the top lane. Alright, there they need. They need Phoenix for that. The red team has already done that at the bottom. Very even, with the red team actually a little bit ahead, and that again just brings us back to Hanzo. They're getting the damage in right now. Good damage, we're talking also from uh, Gul'dan with the Echo Corruption stacks coming in for him. Thrall in trouble, and baby, you need to get out of here. Nope. The War Chief is down, Green Jesus is dead, and he's not the only one. Uh, the dwarf with the beard is also eliminated, and that's a double kill for the Sloth High Lords. No slothing around anymore. Someone woke them from their deep slumber and they are bringing the pain. The pain train has left the station and is headed straight for the red team. But the death timers are low and now they're coming in again. The Alanus Tracer is trying to get that damage in so far unsuccessfully, I might add. But they still have a chance to make that play here. They're going in for it. Phoenix is bringing the damage on the other side. Here's the defense. The choke point completely controlled by the Sloth High Lords, but Blaze is low. Blaze is not the only one. Tracer are also about to fall. They're going for the Immortal again. They might be able to win that after all if they hurry up. This is a race and the blue team wins it, but barely. 800 points on the shields, not a lot. So that can still be defeated quite easily if they play their cards right here, but still. Right now, we have Malfurion with an HSQ on level 7, of course. Makes a lot of sense. It was a bit tricky to see how most wanted actually funneled into the choke point and allowed Blaze to get one jet propulsion after another and also of course Malfurion to lock them down with a root. But still, the immortal isn't really too big, so definitely something that you can defend against. Not a single stack on the level 4 for Tracer yet, so that's definitely an issue. They need more kills if they want to give Mialen the opportunity to get more damage out with Tracer. The level 7 talent going into Jumper. Okay, gets the extra charge in, allows him to go a little bit deeper into the backline and just rush out. But the wall has fallen and now the fort itself is under pressure. Muradin jumps out, barely able to do that. And the pressure continues from Bloody just getting stack after stack with him dropping those Echo Corruptions the entire time. Oh well, just the Corruptions. They're not Echo just yet. We're gonna see that come in in 20 additional stacks. For now he's just sitting at half of them. A top lane. Another camp about to be taken. A 4 versus 4 setup. I'm not quite sure if Meridian can really fight for this, but they're going to be trying to. They're going to move in for it. Meridian's still holding the position, but they just can't get kills here. They can't secure it. They get heroes low, and then they can never follow up on it. So he has to jump out, rely again on the third wind on level 1, and try his best to somehow turn this around. With Horog abilities, I really feel like they might get a little bit more out of this, but to be absolutely honest with you, when we look at just sheer damage output in terms of abilities and pressure on a single hero, the Sloth Hierarchs have a much better lineup. I mean, the damage here, as you can see, 5,000 damage on Tracer. That is not enough. That's definitely not enough. You have Thrall too, so that helps you a little bit, but Tracer has to start getting... Uh, a little bit more work in here. It's definitely not working out for them at this point in time. Very, very annoying for sure. And well, we're gonna see how much that's gonna work for her in the big team fight, but who are you gonna kill? You can try and make the play for Malfurion. Depends a bit on his level 10 choice too. If he, for example, goes into the Twilight Dream and hits a good one against Tracer, she's completely helpless and can be taken out. But outside of that, your best targets are Phoenix, who can warp away and has the shield, or you go for Gul'dan. We have only two kills so far, and both of the kills were against the red team, and now as the next immortal spawns on the map, we're having level 10 abilities, but that might be exactly the play they need, and they execute it perfectly. They take down Phoenix, never face check a bush when you don't have vision of all your opponents, and yep, that's a lesson that he just learned in that last encounter. So he's already down, and that's an opportunity for them to even get a head start, level 10 or no level 10, they don't really care anymore. That's going to be the halftime show right there. 
Muradin, on the other hand, should probably try and get the experience in this one. You still don't have a level 10, boys. You need to make a bit of a play there. Okay, it's Thrall that is sent out instead. Another camp taken. That's two now pushing through the bot lane. But Thrall is going to give them level 10 at this point in time. And they're just racing. Heroic ability is through that. Who needs those? Finally, they have them. But that Immortal is already incredibly low. Now they have to be careful that they don't fall to this, though, because Thrall isn't there yet. Thrall is just now on his way. Everybody jumps out of it. And this is now the time to make a play here. The time to shine. By the way, the sticky bomb on the side of Tracer. And they're gonna try and land it again against Phoenix. Going in, big arrow, the earthquake. Everything is being dropped, the horrify, the sleep. Stay a while, listen baby. The quick move out by Tracer and she's still trying to go in for the kill. Can't make it happen, but still gets the stack for her level 4 quest as Thrall finishes the job and takes Phoenix down. He himself dies, but that's now at least two stacks on the level 4 quest for Tracer. And that Immortal is still looking really weak. If Hanzo ever gets close to it, they're gonna take it down. Bot lane, pressured at the 4. Tracer had to move back to the Nexus and heal up again. It was a 1 for 1 trade, but here comes Hanzo! And Hanzo does Hanzo things. He's starting to poke. And the more he gets in here, the better for them. Ooh, good damage from Gul'dan again. 31 stacks for him. And they're dancing around. If they play it safe, if they play it patiently, they should be able to get the numbers in. It's only a thousand hit points left on that Immortal. Again, Jet Propulsion misses this time though. Uh-oh, Muradin, 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 Muradin! And he goes down. They get the Immortal, but Muradin is dead and Thrall might follow. The Jet Propulsion hits him. But they can't quite get the damage here. Yeah. Ah, unfortunate for them. There's no damage being put out. Did Hanzo just throw his arrow out? I must be seeing things, right? Like he didn't... What? No. I think he did. That was a bit weird. Anyways, they get the Immortal. And it's a big one at the bot lane. But... Yeah. First of all, they have to deal with the top. And nobody is down here. Not... not like, nobody. I think if they would have pushed with anything, they might have been able to get a little bit more, but now it's a five-man defense against the Immortal and it's gonna get the wall, but it doesn't really look like he's gonna get more than that. They're trying to, they're a bit late to the party, but they're still arriving. Muradin missing the Stormbolt here, but they're hoping to at least get the fort here, and to be fair with you, they should. I mean, Thrall is still top lane, they wanna get some more experience, so they need to be careful that they're not forced into a fight. Simolio's a little bit far out though. Gets the Blessed Shield just to save himself, there's no follow-up on it. Backline was already stunned, and the four just barely survives for now. Muradin again, stunned, tries to move out. Nice interrupt against the stay a while and listen. Good salvo, and that is now Deckard Kane eliminated. Deckard was trying to get a stay a while and listen through to allow Muradin to escape and the rest of the team too, but then the immediate interrupt there, and with that happening, eh, he himself too far out and gets dropped. Again, the level 13 choice for Gul'dan here, for Bloody, as we've seen in the first game of the series with the Harvest Life. But even if they didn't get as much as they could, at least Most Wanted is showing that they're in the game, right? They will have level 13 talents for the next objective, and that might be what they need here. Also with the Untouchable, that's 4% extra damage now on Tracer. I mean, it's definitely not quite where you want to be, but as long as she doesn't die and gets more damage out in the next few fights, they might be able to capitalize on the takedowns with giving her even more of an opportunity to more or less insta-kill heroes in the back. Three at the bottom, taking another camp. Again, keep in mind, talent disadvantage for the red team. In terms of damage, Hanzo taking the points here for his team. And most of the pressure so far coming from Most Wanted was against Phoenix. I mean, he's one of the priority targets. He's been taken out now twice. But looking at Tracer, sitting at 13,000 damage. Not quite really getting those. Both of the teams looking again to get their camp as the Immortal gets announced. And this one is going to be really important. Because if the Sloth High Lords win this with already having a level lead over their opponent, they easily are walking away with not only a second forward, but they might even be able to break down the wall at the keep and get a few kills in. So it's going to be a bit rough. Like, most one definitely has to fight and get something out of this. At least drop the shield really low. If it's a big victory for the Sloth High Lords, then I think this game can very, very quickly spiral out of control. But... There's coordination. It's a different story. Don't face check. Rule number one. Muradin. All right. Already triggers this. Saving the space. And there's the stun against Blaze. Just as they're moving in. Blaze with a jet propulsion attempt. Doesn't hit that. Muradin low. Walks straight into the stun. Horrify. Earthquake. And that's the end of that guard. 
Deckard is gonna die. No way! Elena actually survives. Muradin jumps out. How the hell did they make it out of there? Instead, they killed Johanna. Unbelievable. Elena just got the last potion through as the the volley from Phoenix is already in the air. Muradin somehow makes it out of all of it. And then Johanna dies. And all of a sudden, it's a 5 versus 4. And that is a huge opportunity for most wanted to again turn a game around. And they are, of course, trying to take it. They move in immediately. They are already on point with Hanzo, getting the damage and just racing it as quickly as they can. Muradin even anchoring the play a bit. Could already, yeah, hits the Storm Bolt. Gets it in. One away, by the way, from getting his Pierce on the Storm Bolt. Another big one. They get the halftime show, too. And they're still fighting with Blaze here. And Blaze is taking a bit of a beating before we're seeing Johanna being here. Has to use his trade, too, to get out of this. And definitely dropped quite heavily. So now Malfurion having his hands full, trying to get everybody back to full HP. Bunker is there. Blessed Shield as well. Heroic abilities are going to be coming up soon again. And we are in for a bit of a party. The poke continues. And once more we are seeing Most Wanted in the lead in this. Deep jump. Quest completed for Gul'dan for all the damage. But they're going for blue. The Horrify on the other hand. And the immediate collapse onto Thrall. Thrall survives for now. Stay and while Listen is there. They get Gul'dan. Unbelievable. Gul'dan is down. The bunker is broken through. Strider might fall. And he does. But they still get the kill against Malfurion and Phoenix. And now comes Tracer. Tracer by now has seven stacks on her level four. That is fantastic. That's 14% extra damage already. <laughs> it's insane how most wanted. Just turns this around again. A little bit of a grief build if you ask me on the side of Thrall heading into the Grace of Air here. But I mean as long as you're trying to get the survivability with a Frostwolf Resilience stacks, fair enough. Don't get he gets too much out of that. They're already going straight here for the fort at the bot lane. I mean, the Immortal is going to fall because top side, of course. So with that, we're now having them one fort eliminated. The one at the top is going to easily fall too. But the Sloths, they have to be careful here. They're going into the deep slumber again, and they need to remember what happened in game number one. You can have that early lead in the game, but if you're not getting those kills in the late game, you're in trouble. And as long as Tracer doesn't die, then Tracer's damage is also starting to heavily increase. I mean, she's sitting at 22,000 damage. I mean, you can't quite keep up with uh, with a bow and arrow guy, with Willem Tell, Robin Hood, a.k.a. Hanzo. But a lot of his damage is just simply poke damage, whereas Tracer is more so on point and on target. Once again, moving away from Broccoli here. And, well, that's a one keep, oh, sorry, one fort eliminated. And at the pace this is going, we might end up with a keep being destroyed. Here comes the arrow against four. Oh, the Frostwolf Resilience! Bloody nearly dying! Tracer goes in deep, tries to get the kill. Malfurion procs his ult to keep everybody alive and topped up as the Immortal is going through the wall already. Good damage against Strider. Thrall definitely struggling in that encounter, but there are still shields ready and they are poking away. Most wanted going through that wall as if it's nothing, looking for the kill against Bloody. They don't find it. Gul'dan is still alive, but what a game! Jesus, I mean... That is just back and forth the entire time. Three strikes on the Thunderstroke, by the way. Thunderstorm. So getting the extra damage. And slows. But how much damage does he actually have? I didn't even look at it. 34,000. 34k, second highest damage dealer on the side of Nexus Most Wanted after Hanzo. Could also take down the walls here to just make sure that they are not granting any vision to the blue team. And yep, that's exactly what Tracer is doing now. They're getting there. Muradin is still looking for potentially hitting another one. I'm keep in mind that Pierce is going to be super successful for him later. 48k of damage for Gul'dan, by the way. And they're trying to steal the camp. Now, that's an ambitious move. You know they're going to come in for the fight. And yep, there they are. Thunderstorm completed. Earthquake. Earthquake. And cancelling the salvo. No bunker being used. And with Malfurion dying, the salvo cancelled through the stay and violent listen. And now Tracer goes in, gets the kill, moves away, gets the second. 11 stacks. Oh my god. Now we can see why Tracer was banned out in the first game. Again, here in Division 7, of course, the teams, they know each other quite well. And that's exactly the reason why Tracer was banned out in game number one. Mialen didn't die a single time, 11 stacks on the untouchable, looking at 22 stacks at this point, or 22% extra damage. They go through the bottom, that's going to be an easy keep. Should probably not try and make a play for the core here. Just go for the Immortal at this point, take the cams, have the Immortal, 
try and get level 20, but unbelievable. Most wanted. I, in game number one, I already thought, okay, this is a loss for them. In game number one, the, the Sloth High Lords were way too far ahead. Then the turnaround. Then game two comes in, and the High Lords just dominate the game. And now, towards the third one, we have in the beginning... Like, it's basically just the same th story that we saw in game number one. The beginning of the game, the High Lords, they play well, they get their kills, they get slightly ahead, and then all of a sudden, most wanted comes back with vengeance. Half a level away from level 20, they can play the slow. Uh-oh, Muradin has to be careful. Muradin is going to be the target. Yeah, Hanzo with a short distance arrow. It comes through. They go for Blaze. Blaze is low. Blaze is low. Where's that bunker? There it is. And massive damage coming in against most wanted. The Salvo Tracer down. Goodbye, stacks. And Thrall falls too. They get the double kill. And it is perfect for them right now. Hanzo is trying to get out. Yep, he's getting shit on right now. No chance for him either. Three kills. The Sloth High Lords just sitting there and it's like, guys, are you kidding us? Let's make sure that we're not losers this game. 11 kills against 9 now. And that was the perfect setup. Especially Gul'dan with the damage output here. And finally we're seeing a proper uh, purification salvo coming out from side. Several times it was now cancelled whenever he was trying to set it up. This time it's different. And now he's getting the damage, and that's the end of Tracer. And all of a sudden, with as low as the damage on her already is, we're seeing with all the stacks gone, a much tougher time now for her play. 20 talents are in. They're trying to play defense at this point. It's still a 50-50, but they're having three heroes down. And with 20-20, there's already the zoning happening on the side of the High Lords. They're trying to go for another kill. If they can stagger a death, that would be absolutely fantastic for them. But right now, Muradin and Deckard Kane are just simply trying to delay it for as long as they possibly can. Getting those Storm Bolts in. Look at Malfurion, by the way. Jesus! Muradin is absolutely bodying him. Here comes the big connect with Thrall. The slow. They're going in, but there comes the Horrify. They go for Malfurion. And in the back line, Bloody is being attacked by Tracer. Malfurion is about to be dropped. Oh my god, it's happening again, isn't it? Here comes the nice dodge on the Stormbolt with a bunker. They use bunker as much as they can, but Bloody is still low. And now the Immortal is being attacked too. Unbelievable, it's happening again. Johanna is about to die. She goes down, doesn't have the level 20 yet, and therefore no indestructible. <laughs> this is getting nuts. Muradin nearly single-handedly destroyed Malfur in the last fight before Malf could even use Tranquility. And now if you just look at the damage output, I mean, Muradin himself, more damage than Tracer, 37,000 at this point. And of course, now the Immortal goes to the top lane, and they are looking at the bottom of the map, actually. They're trying to pressure Core with only three heroes up, and they go for Blaze first! Oh, boys! Blaze is dead, they have 20, but it's too late. Big Immortal at the top lane. They are going for the core right now. Maybe with a Horrify. 10 seconds out, Bloody might be able to delay it long enough. But it's unlikely. Malfurion is there. The kill against Gul'dan seals the deal. This is gonna be it. The Immortal is already working on the keep at the top lane, but unbelievable. Nexus most wanted. With 16 kills to 9, they actually make it happen. They win the series. They take the 2-1 victory against the Sloth High Lords. What a weird game that we just saw here. That is absolutely crazy. Immortal goes in and that's the end. GG and well played as most wanted takes the win in the series.